Welcome to Neo Academia, where the walls of the ivory tower are shifting. I'm your host, Natasha Mott, and this week I had the pleasure of talking with Adam Seitz about the existential crisis of the modern university. Adam is a professor of law, jurisprudence, and social thought at Amherst College, where his work centers primarily on truth and law. Adam is the author, editor, and translator of several books, including one in the works on the topic we're exploring today. Neo Academia is possible first and foremost because of you. I appreciate your support, and if you love what we're doing here, head over to theorygang.io forward slash newsletter for behind the scenes footage and much more bonus content. Thank you for sharing your most valuable resource, your attention. And if you're interested in making better use of your attention, I got you. Neo Academia is also possible through support from Readocracy. Readocracy is on a mission to save the internet by making how we inform ourselves matter. So they've created a first of its kind technology that rewards people for consuming high quality content. Readocracy makes the content you consume count, awarding points, badges, LinkedIn upgrades, and insights into your information diet. These insights are like a Fitbit for your mind. They can help you understand how your information diet is affecting how you think and feel. Readocracy has won awards and backing from Mozilla and Betaworks, and is used by curious minds at Stripe, Cisco, Zoom, and over 30 other top companies and schools. Neo Academia is proud to be sponsored by Readocracy and has a series of collections curated by me and each of our guests on Readocracy.com. And for access to the Neo Academia resource collections, head over to theorygang.io forward slash newsletter for this episode's show notes. Now let's explore. I was just reading this article you sent me, your response to the humanities and the university in ruin. You are such a beautiful writer. Thank you. That's very sweet of you to say. Yeah. I think a lot of academics write um, in a way that is very technical and not as beautiful, but I think you do both very well. Thank you. I definitely try to provide an experience of intensity and provocation for the reader or listener. Yeah. I mean, you do. Um, And so I read as much as I could here in the last few minutes, but I read your last line. You wrote that what we're doing right now in terms of the university is we're experiencing unalienated labor. Can you maybe tell me what you meant by that? You know, I wrote that 10 years ago, but what I was trying to talk about is the kind of work that in particular humanists do. And the work that I wanted to think about was the work of mourning as Sigmund Freud defined it, where essentially uh, what work involves is an attempt to remember not only who you lost when you lost somebody, like, for example, Socrates or Copernicus, but also what you lost, i.e. what kind of desire or what future or what kind of yearning one lost. And so I was trying to make this argument that I've since made in a more developed way that I think that humanists are professional melancholics. I think that there's something constitutively melancholic about the way that humanists relate to dead authors and then claim to embody the eyes and the ears of those authors. I think that that's a normal way that humanists work. You are an expert in Foucault, is that right? I read him very, very carefully. Okay. (laughs) I have not read him very, very carefully. The only thing I've even attempted is the order of things. And the very beginning was rough, let's just say. And so I skipped back to the human sciences part. (laughs) And the thing that I understand about Foucault is that he, from his origin, had uh, somewhat of a mistrust of the institutions and the norms of the world. And he placed a lot of for lack of a better word, he placed a lot of blame on the institutions and really disregarded an objective truth about the world and said, there is no objective truth. It's just what these institutions tell us it is. And so he cited science and all these other, you know, institutions that we hold. So I'm kind of wondering, your main focus is about truth and law, and you're an expert in Foucault. So I think I know your perspective, but I'd love for you to tell me Is there objective truth? Do you agree with Foucault? Tell me. Sure. I mean, to begin on that point, I don't think that it takes Foucault to question objective truth. I would give you Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Kuhn talks there about paradigm shifts and the way in which um, new paradigms kind of come into being because they solve different parts of puzzle that prior paradigms didn't explain. 
And would I say that Kuhn rejects objective truths, whatever that might mean? Probably not, but Kuhn talks a lot about the kind of social conditions or even at points, the generational conditions under which sciences shift paradigms. It would also give you Weber, uh, Max Weber, the vocation of science, this 1917 lecture where there's definitely a commitment to the value-free description of the world. And that's probably just clearly fact-based kind of description of the world. That's probably what we mean by objective truth. But many of the dynamics that Foucault is talking about, most principally the kind of competition between incommensurable viewpoints are already apparent in, in Weber. I think that's the way I would put that part of it. I'm aware that Francis Fukuyama in his recent book on, I think it's an illiberal democracy or to, sorry, you know, liberalism and its discontents places a lot of blame on Foucault for the kind of decay of truth in the contemporary moment. I think that's misplaced and your viewers, I would urge your viewers to go and read Weber as a kind of, a lot of what Fukuyama dislikes is already there in Weber. So in the sense that the kind of irreducible pluralism of commitments to different values that inform the way that we understand science. So the other thing I'd say, I agree with you a hundred percent that Foucault was suspicious of institutions. That's where I break with Foucault. Um, and I'm more influenced by a contemporary philosopher in Italy named Roberto Esposito, who made your exact point, which is that Foucault and a lot of thinkers who are influenced by Foucault accept a dichotomy between movements, social movements on the one hand, and then institutions on the other, where institutions are rigid, segmented, they're by definition oppressive, they're about power, they hold people down, and movements are always kind of life-giving and, and so forth. And I think Esposito is right that Foucault accepts a kind of simplistic view of institutions. So that part I very much agree with, the way you characterize Foucault. Right. Well, I see, you know, and I've heard people talk about Foucault and it always seems like they're kind of trying to shift the blame off of him a little bit saying like, no, other people, other people said this too. But when it comes to Kuhn, the way I think about his philosophy is that the kind of the beginning of emergent truths rather than static truths, mm -hmm. it, you could call that deterministic, but everything is evolving. Reference point that I think is so important here, um, and maybe we'll post this for your viewers, is Hannah Arendt's 1967 essay called Truths in Politics. And it's a phenomenal essay. It's so important. But the part that matters most to me is the part that goes the following. If I'm a truth seeker, I experience truth as compulsion. I don't have a choice. If the equation is two plus two, except to conclude four. Every kind of scientific or even humanistic or social scientific kind of inquiry has that element of compulsion, she says. And what's so fascinating is that there's kind of a bifurcation. On the one hand, if truth then expresses itself in a democratic society, it tends to express itself in the mode of a kind of despotism or a coercion. You must conclude that two plus two is four. You must wear a mask because I've studied public health. You must get vaccinated. And there's a kind of despotic or kind of coercive character to truth itself. The problem, Arendt says, is that truth, once it enters into the public sphere, unfortunately, under conditions where basically all government rests on opinion, truth becomes one among many opinions. This is why I would defend Foucault against this kind of argument. If I kind of experience objective truth as an absolute compulsion, say I'm a climate scientist and I'm looking at the kind of deposits and the kind of geological kind of residues, and I'm trying to draw inferences about what that teaches me for the next extinction. I don't have the freedom to kind of cook the data. That makes me a bad scientist. I have a compulsion to report that as truth and as fact, given the kind of internal criteria of my discipline. But I think the thing we're all struggling with today is that that becomes completely jellified or kind of, you know, it yeah. becomes really relativized once it becomes a matter of public opinion. And that's like completely intolerable for any truth seeker to hear. But because Arendt says that differently than Weber, and, you know, we can set Kuhn aside for the moment. I would say there are a lot of different people who are trying to think through the relationship between truth as a kind of compulsion. And also the kind of irreducible plurality of opinions in the public sphere. And thinking a lot about institutions, but 
One thing I would say to you is that the university has changed and it has integrated movements into itself. Contrary, I think, to the idea that they're perhaps Foucaultian, perhaps otherwise, that they're always static. And I think beginning in the 70s in particular, I mean, universities traditionally were all male. Let's just begin there. Um, yeah. As recently as the early 20th century. And in many cases, they were all white as well, or they had kind of racial quotas. So I think in the 70s, that begins to shift. And I think a lot of the kind of administrative apparatuses you see today bear the kind of historical scar tissue of past movements in ways that are sometimes desirable and sometimes undesirable, but that nevertheless bear witness to the fact that movements have transformed these institutions. It's no longer a monastic institution. <laughs> where people are walking around in kind of robes and so on and so forth. And we can talk about the Reformation and the way that the Reformation changed the university as well. That's a big movement. So what do I think needs to happen today? I think woe unto he or she who talks about the university with the definite article. <laughs> so like, and that's a dodge and you'll call it a dodge and you'll be right to call it a dodge. Just kind of bear with me for a moment. Like I feel claims about the university are like claims about Shakespeare plays or, or better quotes from Shakespeare plays where people quote, like, for example, Portia's speech from the Merchant of Venice about the quality of mercy. And they think they're kind of describing beautiful speech about mercy and all of its kind of wonderful characteristics. Once you integrate that into the play as a whole with its incommensurable multiplicity of viewpoints, and you kind of realize this is the most anti-Semitic play that Shakespeare ever wrote. You realize you're reading one stage in the prosecution of Shylock, um, and that the kind of punchline is that because Shylock doesn't accept Christ as his personal savior, he doesn't understand mercy, and therefore the court ought to be merciless towards him. So that's kind of the way I feel about universities. They're like practices without a theory. They're a multiplicity without a unity. Probably that's part of the problem, right, is that there's no kind of Meta language or overall account of what a given university does. So I'll begin there. I'm always wary when I'm trying to talk about the university. I would prefer to talk about the academy, but if we want to talk about the university, then I think I would say that in the way that I think about the university, which is kind of deeply influenced by a scholar named Ernst Kemptorowitz, who some of your viewers may know, he wrote a very famous book in 1957 called The King's Two Bodies. In that book, he devotes an entire chapter to the university at the same time that he was involved in a kind of controversy at the University of California, Berkeley, over a loyalty oath that the regents, the University of California, Berkeley, were requiring all professors to swear against communism. Ken Torowitz was kind of on the right-hand side of the spectrum. He, there's no chance this guy is a communist. But in any case, he refuses to take the oath in the name of the institution. And I just want to kind of read to you because we're going to talk about the existential crisis of the university. And I just want to read to you part of the um, quote that interests me from this 1950 piece that he writes. And this is what I think of when I think of the university. The university, he says, is the Universitas Magistrorum et Scholarium, the body corporate of masters and students. Teachers and students together are the university, regardless of the existence of gardens and buildings, caretakers or gardens, and so forth. One can envis envisage a university without a single gardener or janitor, without a single secretary, or even a bewitching mirage, without a single regent. The constant and essence of a university is always the body of teachers and students. End quote. That's what I would say to you, Natasha, is that the university is that intergenerational nexus, teachers to students, of teachers who have kind of dedicated their lives to a branch of learning and who are maybe in the middle of their life or nearing the end of their life, and students who are beginning their life and who basically are trying to essentially study with this person who is a time machine, in some sense, somebody who is integrated into their own mortal body, a stock of knowledge. And that the student is essentially relating to when the student relates to the, to the master or the teacher. That nexus to me is the beating heart of the institution, the beating heart of the university. And everything else is kind of clustered around it or historical scar tissue that kind of develops next to it. Let me stop there and just see if that scans with you or if that raises questions. I see the 
ideal. To me, this is like very much like a form, like Plato's form yeah. of what it should be. Do I think that is what it is anymore? Not entirely. No, I think it's fractionated into a million different versions of that where I'm not sure if it matters if you think about the medieval institutions. The purpose of those institutions was to create professionals who could interpret the papal law, right? And then, you know, do medicine and law and all those other kinds of things. I think we are so much closer to that version than to Plato's Academy, which I, when you say the Academy, I don't know if that's what you meant by it. But if that is the ideal, then sure, we're there. Because I see that that is one version of what you said. And then I see Plato's Academy as another version. Those are two very different things. There's a vocational track and then there's a how to live track. But maybe you could speak to the academy that you said you'd rather speak to. <laughs> well, I mean, we have two lines going here. But first of all, let me say, accept that characterization. I think that that's right. And I do think that there is a kind of vocational element to the university as, as there always has been, exactly as you're saying. I think the entire, one of the entire purposes of the medieval university on my read was exactly that, to produce a kind of administrative or clerical class that would basically not just kind of serve Christ, which is part of the kind of whole Catholic apparatus, but also kind of administer towns and, and communes and, and so on and so forth. So I accept that. To me, the kind of interesting thing about the Kentorowitzian idea of the body corporate is that it's intergenerational. And you, you talked about fragmentation a moment ago. So, I mean, let's take each kind of generation in turn and then talk about the crisis or the existential crisis of that institution. And then maybe later we'll get back to the academy. But I mean, the way that I think about it is like the body of scholars today, what does that actually mean? The body of scholars can't talk to itself. Like I've looked over your Google Scholar profile and I don't know what an, H an HDA access is or <laughs> receptors. So we're talking on terms that are familiar to me for which thank you, by the way, but like, it's a constitutive problem of any body of scholars. It can't talk to itself. The social sciences can't talk very easily about the humanities, can't talk very easily to kind of STEM areas, can't talk very easily to the arts. So the, at the level of the scholars, there's kind of internal division and almost incommunicability at the level of the students. I think it's manifestly the case in the medieval university that there were nations that people came and they stayed with different groups according to their national origins and their languages and so forth. And that version of diversity was a critical part of the medieval university as it is today for us. Students don't always relate very well to one another across these ethnic class divides. And so in just the same way that the, I think scholarly body can't talk to itself, the student body can't talk to itself with great clarity requiring perhaps the kind of interventions of this whole administrative class that misogynism kind of integrates the, the student body and, and ensures that it's kind of not inflicting damage on itself. So I think maybe you and I are talking about the same thing, but I think the thing that matters the most to me, if you accept that, is that today intergenerational continuity, something's happening to it. And I think that's the crisis of the university. And just to be very blunt, I would put it in a twofold manner, you know, setting aside everything else that's wrong with the university, like funding of the university, student debt, uh, corruption in athletics, overbearing administrators. We could talk all day about that. But what's so fascinating today is that I think, hey, something is happening to the field of the unknown. Something is happening to the field of discovery or the desire, what Foucault would call the desire to know. Like, what is it that drives us into the university in the first place? It used to be this kind of vast field of the unknown. So that kind of like curiositas, the kind of craving to know something made it into a kind of playground. The library is this, for many students still today, it's a kind of just like candy store. They can't believe it. <laughs> I think something's happened to the field of the unknown. I think it's kind of flattened out. And I think the kind of feeling that I can turn to my handheld device and kind of research anything I want and get some kind of answer. I think that's kind of deflating this virtual field, the field of the unknown. And it's, I think it's modifying the way the desire to know operates today within institutions. I think students have less of a craving or less of a desire to know. And we can talk about the connection 
to kind of skill acquisition and vocational education. But I think even more importantly than that, the students I know who are, you know, great are suffering from a loss of future. They're suffering from a loss, a sense that basically the future holds, you know, kind of climate apocalypse, for lack of a better word, political dysfunction in our country, quasi-civil war conditions. And so that, when you kick out the temporal support from underneath this intergenerational transfer, then I think you have this kind of pointlessness or this kind of loss of purpose or this loss of direction or goal or loss of teleology. And that I think is an existential crisis for the university. If the university is defined as really kind of the relationship between teachers and students from generation to generation, to generation, to generation. But let me stop there and see if, if we're talking to each other. I can agree with your definition about the intergenerational exchange. I think that's huge. And I think a number of things are happening and my mind immediately went to two branches that are different, but have been kind of criticized for trying to be similar. For example, uh, physics has reached a critical point. I know Fukuyama talked about the end of history, but it's kind of like happening in physics as well. There's a, we're at a standstill. There are things and breakthroughs that happen, but it has to kind of like emerge from something breaking. We can't hold the same truths anymore that we did. You know, relativity's probably got to go. Space time's probably got to go. Some of these things have to go. And I think there's a stagnation that's been hitting in terms of technological progress. And when I think about kind of what happened with the advent of postmodernism, Chomsky said that postmodernists tried to be like physicists and create this ornate language to glorify their explorations. And I thought that was an interesting analysis, but there's something there where we've kind of stopped making gains in physics. We've started making gains into not the unknown, but what seems to be the unknowable that, you know, from Nietzsche and then Camus and, you know, kind of continue on into this godless kind of void. We don't, what for, you know, it's a big, what for, and I feel like we're reaching that like Nietzschean crisis moment where we don't, the authority is nothing. Where is, where is authority? What does it mean? And I think the resistance on the right is to say, okay, everybody hang on. That may be true, but like, we can't let this get out of hand. And where the left is like, no, we got to let it do what it do, you know? And the intergenerational aspect of that, there's a mistrust of authority. If you look at the age of professors. There's this divide between students and professors now. The age of the professoriate is increasing, and there's a distrust amongst those two. Like, I mean, the, the whole OK Boomer situation. It's a complete disregard and lack of history. I think there's like an ahistorical perspective that a lot of young people have. And because of this existential crisis, they think, fuck it, why do I have to listen to you? You got us here, I think, is part of that problem. I would agree, and I would double down on that. And here's the way I would double down on it, is that institutions, especially the most progressive ones, not only laden their students with actual economic debt, but with what Nietzsche would call schuld, which is the German, you know, means kind of guilt and debt at the same time. And so progressive institutions involve a lot of people like myself who basically say, go change the world. Here, here's 32 classes. Here's 32 reasons why the world is terrible. And now you're in debt. And you feel like absolutely nothing can kind of like come of anything, but go reconcile these kind of competing economic and moral imperatives. Good luck. And we'll see her in mm -hmm. 10 years at donate to the college, please. So like, is her generational hypocrisy? Absolutely. I think that that is something that we need to think about by we, I mean, any person who's involved in this kind of like location needs to question themselves about those conditions conditions that exist prior to the student entering the classroom, i.e. debt, but also the kind of conditions that exist afterwards, the melancholy of a student who just opens up the New York Times, sees 10 different things that are wrong with the world, um, and basically hits a state of overwhelm and impotence, not despite, but because they have a kind of cosmopolitan conscience. So that happens after graduation, it, in my perspective, and I don't think mm -hmm. that there's enough self-consciousness about that. I think what I would also say is like, Arendt has this great essay, parts of it are great, called On Violence, where she talks about the new left 
in the 60s, which she says is the first generation that kind of comes of age under conditions of futurelessness. We're not the first generation, you and I. They came of age under conditions where they realized that nuclear weapons existed and that the technical capacity to destroy the world was present. And I think what's so interesting there is, and she talks specifically exactly as you were saying about the loss of authority, it's precisely the words that she used. And it's right there in the footnotes. She says the university is an institution like the Catholic church that runs on authority alone. Authority is not coercion. It's not force. Authority is when you're talking. And when you're talking, I hear the whole history of brain science kind of like in your person, that kind of corporate second body of just like absolute knowledge. And I listen attentively to you, not because you're forcing me to, or not because there's a penalty or incentive, but because there's this kind of like time machine or this kind of accumulation or wisdom in you. And she says, technological change together with futurelessness has kind of broken the thread of tradition and authority. And that's how she interprets the student riots that are happening, not only in like Cornell, but Mexico, Paris, all over the world, Czechoslovakia, Prague, et cetera. So I think you're right. I think that it's something that professors have to meet on its own terms and we have to think through. And what I see primarily in the kind of public sphere is a lot of complaining about it, a lot of blaming students for it. And like, you know, maybe two cheers for that. There are students who go to excess. But imagine yourself waking up in this world, <laughs> you you begin to read and you begin to understand like, oh, okay, there are guns everywhere. Oh, okay, there's climate change. Oh, okay, there's a dysfunctional Senate for the most part, judiciary is dysfunctional. Why would you not feel absolute betrayal by the generations that preceded you? And why would you not regard with absolute suspicion the professors who are institutions who are taking huge amounts of money and leaving you with moral debt, a kind of the sense? So I, you know, three cheers for that argument. I think that that's a realistic assessment of where the profession is today. Sometimes I see professors as impotent. When I was in school, I had that kid in a candy store kind of mentality. I was just so excited about everything. And then once it got to be time for me to get a job and hit the tenure track, I thought, you guys are a joke. Is what I thought, you know, maybe back, you know, 10, 20 years ago when things seemed a little bit more normal, I wouldn't have felt that way. But now I'm looking at them and I feel like a lot of professors don't actually see what's going on. And I think tenure is a big part of it because they're protected, because they haven't had the insecurity that this generation has. A lot of people are envious of that. They think it's not deserved. And there's a lot of attacks on on tenure and academic freedom, as I talked about in my last episode. Uh, it just feels like there's there's attacks from all angles. And then I think there's a young class of people, and I consider myself part of this, that feel a responsibility to do something about it. And I think that's the minority. Um, I think the vast majority of people my age and younger feel utterly exhausted. They don't have time. They don't have energy. They don't even know where to start. It feels like a behemoth they're up against in terms of all these institutions, all the money, what can they do? But then there's people like me who are like, fuck it, what do I got to lose? I'm going to go and charge it, you know, and see what I can do. At least see where maybe there are some, um, you know, places for entry or places to kind of change. And I wish there were more people that felt that way. But I think you have to break through all the untruths that are out there now. So like you mentioned, oh, you wake up in the morning and you see the New York Times with all, you know, these 10 things that are a problem. But then you don't forget the New York Times isn't entirely honest, isn't entirely accurate, and also has its own, let's say, motives. So I feel like sometimes they're trying to keep everybody docile and quiet and unable to move and saddled with debt so that you can't overcome it and you can't break the trajectory. So I think sometimes we have to resist that. And that's what I hope is next, is a breaking through of the norms and the existential crisis that we're facing and, and, a, and a re-adherence of those things. Like what we're doing here, we're kind of breaking this intergenerational divide by just having this conversation. So I guess, you know, one question I would have for you is what is it in the kind of 
history and theory of the university that's worth saving or that's worth fighting for. I mean, and maybe you and I would puzzle that through for, for a couple of minutes. And the reason why I settle on Kid Torah was I have a lot of reasons, but he provides me as an answer to that question. What's the beating heart of the university? Once you strip away all the kind of unnecessaries, all of all the amenities, all of the kind of excesses that currently define the university, what's the mm-hmm. core? That's the mm-hmm. core to me. And so maybe maybe you would have a different answer. But I feel like there's a new institutionalism afoot. I feel like there's a new kind of minimalism afoot. There's a new desire for a kind of simplicity in these institutions. There are crises everywhere you look. And maybe we could begin talking about some of the other elements that you introduced at the outset of the conversation. These crises hit us at a time when it has never been more important for an institution in the body politic more generally to kind of adjudicate the difference between disputable and undisputable facts. So that's the real kicker for me. Like, believe me, I have a thousand criticisms of the institution and I swallow a lot of those when I ask myself, well, what is the institution's relationship to a polity that seems to be governed by just whim, caprice, and opinion? That's the other dimension here. We need university. We need academic freedom. And we need professors who are not kind of cruel in the way they neglect the next generation. To triage this, what's important to me is the preservation of knowledge, right, wrong, indifferent, hegemonic, whatever you want. We're sitting here sharing a conversation and speaking about history and the current environment and the projections of the future. That's what is worth preserving. Because even if nothing is true, even if there is no objective truth, at one time we believed there was. And holding on to that and remembering that and having conversations about that, I think it's still important, you know, to understand the functions of history and and where we came from and to create new knowledge. So if we were if I were to preserve something, it would be this transfer of knowledge. But why not? have databases, AIs, and as we were talking 10 years ago, uh, MOOCs, massive online courses. Why not preserve and transmit knowledge that way? Why is the institution that we inherited from like Oxford, Cambridge, Paris, Bologna, why, why that institution in particular? Can't those be decoupled, disintermediated, all of that stuff? I think they can, but there has to be human stewards of it. And I think that is what's really important because if we just, have you played around with the chat GPT thought no. at all? No. I dare you. I dare you. Get really specific and uh, you're going to be blown away. But in playing with that stuff, it's not there yet and it could be, but there still needs to be a human to decide what to enter. What are we interested in? Where are we going to go? And there's no reason that those two things can't coexist. But the existing institution has to adapt far more than it ever has. Otherwise, it's going to break or it's going to fractionate off again into something, something else. And, I don't, and that's the thing I'm interested in. What is this going to be? Because I don't see the model of vocation being sustainable for these institutions as vocational training grounds to charge, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. That's not going to be viable in the future. So... I think we're going to head back towards a more cloistered academic world where it's even more sequestered from the public than it ever has been. And that's saying a lot. But what I think is there's kind of two parts of the university. There's the classes and the teaching and the the graduating students and the timekeeping and what is socially acceptable now to study and, you know, kind of pushing people that way. And then there's the research. You do a lot of thinking, a lot of synthesizing. And almost nobody probably knows about that kind of stuff. Like I was looking at your books and I'm like, these look very fascinating. I wonder who reads them. (laughs) I mean, there's a double problem here. Even if it's not the jargon that you were talking about earlier, every discipline has specialized knowledge or specialized language. In the humanities, there are kind of references, texts, dates, history. And um, I think that constitutes its own one barrier. But the other, which is newer, I think is the paywall. What I see missing in the kind of public discussion over the university's relationship to the so-called 
post-truth kind of social work is the way that Elsevier and all of these other kind of publishing companies have essentially taken valid knowledge and kind of sequestered that knowledge behind paywalls. So you, the proposition is that you're going to pay $40 for one of my articles. No one's going to do that. So multiply that by a factor of, you know, X and you get the kind of epistemological crisis that I think we're suffering through right now. And I think we've been complicit. I think we've been complicit. The specialization issue is one thing, but the paywall issue is another thing altogether. So I do think the university has a responsibility into the post-truth moment, but it's not what we think. And oftentimes when I hear people chatting in the faculty lunchroom, it's like, well, we need to tell people the truth. They don't know. <laughs> That's the problem. We know the truth and they don't know the truth. I'm like, well, that would be really a very self-serving and kind of comforting if that were the case. I happen to think that it's way more ironic than that. Is there a new minimalism coming? Probably. Is it going to be kind of cloistered? It's an interesting choice of word on, on your part because it has kind of religious overtones. And I wonder if that was intentional. I mean, sometimes I say shit and I don't know if it's intentional or not, but I do see it being more religious because the way we, I think about knowledge now, it's kind of a new God. The new gods are knowledge, information, data, billionaires. And we've talked about the role of the professoriate as a priest and a judge. Maybe you can kind of articulate that. I think that'd be an interesting thing to hear. Sure. I mean, let's just do bread and butter academic freedom. I mean, it's the right of scholars and teachers to teach and publish without fear of persecution by authorities. And it's the kind of affirmative right and responsibility to self-regulate so that Bodies of experts are really the kind of only people who can determine the quality of the expert production of knowledge. So it's kind of peer review is the beating heart of the professional definition of academic freedom. So should we pause there and kind of go back and forth? Does that match with your, your sense? I mean, yeah, let's go back to what I said about it being cloistered. What I see there is more of a research based era that we're heading, heading into that it's cloistered in the sense that it's esoteric, it's forbidden, it's specialized. It's so far removed from the everyday man who doesn't even know how his phone works that there's no need for him to know it. And in that sense, I imagine what we're going into is kind of a very bizarre dark age where it's been brought about by the technology that we have, like you said. But the irony is that in order to grow and in order to publish more, Elsevier you know, tries to charge these, these universities and then nobody gets access to them except other universities. And it serves the purpose of keeping it cloistered. And because of that, we had an incident like with Aaron Schwartz. And then now we have um, Sci-Hub and these places where you can kind of secretly get that information, but it's only for the renegades and the people who, who does that? Um, you know, almost no one. And so where I see us heading is this place where the ivory tower is even more enshrined than it ever was and more clerical than it ever was. And these priests are practicing. They're immune from any kind of problems of capitalism. They're protected by God, in a sense. I see the same thing. And I think I, I see it from a kind of historical angle, but I see the same thing. And the way I would arrive at a similar conclusion would be to say the following, which is that if you accept the idea that academic freedom is not simply the individual right of an individual professor to say extraordinary things in a kind of extramural or public sense, which by the way, I believe it is, but more fundamentally and much more sexily, the kind of just like standard kind of day-to-day -day work of peer review, of adjudicate, of double blind uh, manuscript reviews where I get a manuscript, I don't know the name of the, um, kind of author and, and I'm reviewing just the claims and then I'm submitting it back to an editor and the editor is saying like, well, I've got four reviews of your book and so forth. To me, that's like the essence of professional academic freedom from what it looks like in my like weekly schedule. Okay. How do you then defend that publicly to somebody who, whose tax dollars you're asking for? Because now it gets fascinating because argument for academic freedom is a pretty weak argument from Socrates forward. It's just like, yeah, I'm the gadfly. I'm going to bite and sting you. Can I please have your tax dollars so that I can do that? It's Athens is like, how about we execute you? Um, so. 
it's always been a weak argument and different authors have made different arguments in favor that are they're, you know, compelling to differing degrees. But what fascinates me is the way that the profession takes its norms from professions other than itself. So on the one hand, like in my view of the history of American academic freedom, the norms of the professoriate are taken from the norms of the independent judiciary. And you, there's something that I gave you that kind of makes that argument. I won't belabor the point, but the idea of like kind of unbiased or impartial judgment or in a Weberian sense, like I'm not going to put my personal values into this. I'm just going to judge the facts. I think that's all kind of indebted to a paradigm of judgment in the American tradition begins with the Federalist Papers and in the German tradition goes back to Kant. Okay. So what is a good professor? A good professor is a professor who acts like a judge. I think that's one whole way of thinking about the profession. But the other one is exactly the one you mentioned. It's the medieval heritage and the professor is the one who's trying to save the world and is trying to kind of engage in kind of the salvation of the world or the conversion of souls. And I think that's a deep legacy, not only in the American university, but also in the profession. The profession itself owes a lot of its kind of basic practices to moral claims and moral pursuits. And to come back to something else you were saying, I think once the kind of desire to know or the kind of epistemic cravings of the public are satisfied by these devices, the more that that happens, the less they're going to be willing to obviously turn to institutions like colleges and universities and pay X number of dollars for those epistemic cravings to be satisfied. Now, I need to immediately qualify that by saying, I don't think that it's the same. I think that if you're truly going to have sequenced knowledge and you're truly going to become an expert in a field, you can't just do it online. And Maybe you and I agree there. You, you need somebody who's going to work with you in the specific way that you're engaging with the field and so forth. But what I see happening is that the epistemic support or the epistemic purpose of the university has been kicked out from underneath it by virtue of information storage and retrieval systems, leaving the kind of return of the repressed moral purposes as the kind of dominant purposes of, of the university. We're trying to save the world as we should. We should pursue the true and the good together. And historically, you know, there's a great book by um, Julie Rubin called The Making of a Modern University, which details this. Uh, between the late 19th century and the early 20th century, there was a kind of idea called the unity of truth, she argues. She just shows it like empirically. The unity of truth is the idea that kind of empirical study of the natural world and Christian theology kind of come to the same conclusion. And that was that they belong at least to the same kind of horizon, or the same kind of experience. And gradually under the influence of, you know, Darwinian evolution, among other things, those get ripped apart. The unity of truth begins to disintegrate by the thirties and forties, leaving a kind of moral dimension of the university as a kind of administrative structure so that essentially you have this like student life, for example, it kind of looks after the kind of character of the soul in a secularized sense of the student body. If you accept that claim, there's always been a kind of moral quality to the university. It's never been just let's search for the truth and let the whole world be destroyed, you know, depending on what the truth is. No, there's always been a balance between the true and the good, except today, the epistemic kind of like is being, has been knocked out and the moral remains. And that's what people like Jonathan Haidt are perceiving, but I think wrongly, I think that in kind of mystified and distorted way. Yeah, I think they're seeing exactly what you're talking about because you, you hear about people talking about the university as being a place for advocacy. And that speaks to your analogy of being judges. I think everyone is afraid of the university dictating morality. And they pretended like it never did before. But before it served God, like capital G God. So there, there's a lot of protest, I think, because people aren't willing to let go of objective morality and give the moral reins to a place that has been like, no, nah, anything goes. So there's a push against that. Also, everybody today is their own judge, jury, and executioner. <laughs> You can decide what you want to do with information, how you want to pursue it, and whether you believe it, whether it's trash, and nobody's going to tell you otherwise. 
so I think that's part of it as well. So they don't see the university as housing judges or clergy. So they're like, what's the point? If they if you don't hold those people in authority in any way, that's where I think it's going to head more into a dark age because without, you know, a guiding light, I feel like it's been the university. It's been this like hope of democracy. Where, where do we go? Well, I mean, I mean, we could talk about Chomsky, we could talk about Iran, and we could talk about the Vietnam War. And both of these authors point to the fact that like really bright, well-trained Ivy League social scientists were in the upper echelons of the Kennedy administration and among other administrations and helped plan and execute this completely, I think, of military loss and a, I think an immoral war. And so I would contest the idea that um, universities are always necessarily in the kind of camp of democracy that certainly the medieval university coexisted perfectly well with the worst kinds of persecution. <laughs> with popes and kings, completely anti-democratic. And then to kind of really kind of turn the blade, I think, you know, a lot of people who think about American academic freedom love the German research university and really turn to it for the kind of core freedoms of teaching and learning that kind of supposedly emerge in the research university in the late 19th century. But my question to those scholars is what happens to the German research university first in World War I and then in World War II. And in World War I, there are German scholars, really good scholars, you know, leaders of their field, who are throwing their weight in petitions behind the German war effort in World War I. In World War II, it gets worse. There, there's a really important article that I'll, that's open access that I'll send, send to you by a historian at the University of Vienna, who goes through and says, well, what actually happened to academic freedom during Nazism? And his conclusion, Timothy Ash is his name, his conclusion is that, yes, there's persecution, there's racism, there's basically all kinds of monitoring of the universities by the National Socialists, but there's also actual science going on. Um, and he then, he's, he says, we shouldn't be too quick to kind of like conclude that academic freedom and democracy are commensurable. I could talk about Roscoe Pound, who was one of the signers of the 1915 Declaration that kind of founded the tradition of um, American academic freedom. He went to Nazi Germany and toured the universities and was given awards and kind of rubbed shoulders with a, a lot of, so like, I think it's important to kind of like own up to the facts that the university isn't always a kind of shining light. The other thing I would say is just to kind of tie a bow on our earlier conversation. The argument that I would like to make is that these kind of competing genealogies of, of the priests on the one hand and the judge they enter into contradiction because if I'm trying to save the world, I know the revealed truth of the world. And I'm absolutely certain that, as you said, that there are objective moral truths, that there's good and evil. Judges need to look at the evidence. They need to remain impartial. They need to connect facts and law. They need to withhold judgment until essentially the case has revealed itself. And I think what's happening now is that those two genealogies are really causing interference. So that on one hand, I'm supposed to be even handed when there is like, there are like white supremacists and Nazis. And on the other hand, I'm supposed to convince my students to save the world as I, as I see it. And I'm supposed to impose my morality on them. No, both of those kind of models, I think are failing us today. And that's kind of like what I wanted to say earlier. Where does that leave us? I think it's definitely the case that the right perceives. Well, let's talk about the rights criticism. Yeah, yeah let's, mm -hmm. this is fun. Okay. So. <laughs> I did a little test in preparation and your, your viewers can do this too. I went to the Amherst, I teach at Amherst college in Massachusetts, very liberal state, very liberal college. And I did a keyword search for Marx in the college website. And I came up with five courses in the last 10 years that are taught on Marx. Three of them are from visiting professors and one is a permanent course. Now in the last, I actually didn't calculate how many courses are taught in the last you know, 10 years, but it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So like, I don't think there's a lot of Marxism at but college. I'm going to push <laughs> back on speaking. this. I don't think it's a hotbed of, of communist. But all this work is derivative. You may not be referencing Marx because there's no need to anymore because it's been iterated on. I mean, I think most of my colleagues at the college would 
agree more with John Dewey than they agree with Marx, that basically there are experts who need to serve democracy. Democracy is kind of like a kind of quasi-religious cause. That is the ultimate expression of good in the world. That plural democracy in particular is the kind of way in the light. And I think that they think expert knowledge can improve that experience. That I think is the common sense of the you're also an East Coast University, though. And I think you view, you have an interesting view because I think you're looking above critical theory in a sense without necessarily being implicated in it. You can see things like you wrote in your one article that, you know, feminism and queer theory and gender studies, these are all a scapegoat for the bigger underlying problem. And that I think is what you're getting at here is this existential crisis. And you don't, you don't blame one domain. You don't blame critical theory for the demise of the university. Whereas I feel like the right is like, no, that's, that's why, that's why we're falling apart. There's no truth. Yeah. So let's put a name to the claim. And I think, you know, William F. Buckley Jr.'s Got a Man at Yale, um, 1951, subtitled On the Superstitions of Academic Freedom, in quotes has a claim to being the origin of modern conservatism in as much as what he does in that book is unite together the kind of libertarian free market wing of the Republican Party with the Christian wing of the Republican Party because he's saying at Yale, they're teaching communism and atheism together. So this is not my claim. Other scholars have made this claim. I tend to agree with it. And exactly as you're saying, his claim there is that at Yale, they're claiming that anything goes and so forth, and that they're relativists and, and all of these things. But I think there's a deeper kind of, I think there are two ironies. First, the right's claim today is opposite of Buckley's claim. The right's claim today is that anything should go and you should have free speech on campus. You should just basically open the doors of campus and let any speaker of whatever political stripe on and they can say whatever they want. So contemporary conservatives are arguing against kind of the 1950s conservatives. But the more interesting claim has to do with the way that Buckley uses the phrase academic freedomites. That's what he calls scholars in that text. He puts the suffix ITE at the end of academic freedom in order to indicate that it's become a kind of religion. And that I think is the most fascinating part of that critique, which is on the one hand, if you look at Dewey and the history of like the way that John Dewey's work emerges, I think there's actually truth to that claim. Dewey is like a really religious guy in the 1880s and 1890s. And then he kind of shifts to this more kind of like what seems to be kind of secular pragmatism in, in his later life. So the, the idea that kind of like secular pragmatic academia has a kind of charge to it, a kind of religious or moral charge, I actually think is well placed. I think that it leads to different conclusions, obviously, than Buckley indicates. So I think that there are religious traces in the way that the secular university operates. I think that the conservatives critique of the university factually is untrue. I don't think that Marxism is everywhere in universities. I think that you go around, like walk down the hallway of a chemistry department, walk down the hallway of a physics department, take three hours of walk throughout the whole campus. You're not going to find a little Marxist. You're going to find a few, right? The young people that I see are not. They don't believe in the dictatorship of the proletariat. They just don't. Even if they did, I don't know what mass movement they would try to belong to. They believe in kind of tweaks to free market capitalism of the sort that are kind of normal in a lot of places in the world. And um, I don't think that's Marxist. I think Marxists would say that tweaking capitalism so that it survives longer is not communism. But so factually, I don't think it's true. But what I do think is fascinating is like that even though universities are in crisis, I do think the right has a fantasy of their power. And that's interesting. And we should think about it in the following sense. Like the university on the one hand is foreign. It's filled with people who talk in ways that don't make sense. Some of them are quite arrogant. Some of them are quite cruel. Many of them are impotent um, in the sense that they're powerless to kind of affect the changes that they desire. So they put it on um, students and so on and so forth. Many appear to be atheists, non-believers. So it would be reasonable to conclude they don't believe what they believe. The university is a foreign entity within the body politic. And I actually think that there's truth to that too. I think universities are 
fundamentally kind of like oddballs and strangers in democratic republics. They pre-exist democracy. They coexist with other forms of politics that aren't democratic. They're weird institutions. They're not 100% democratic. I think we sugarcoat that in the way we defend universities. I would say that shots fired against the university because it, they're shifty. They can acquiesce to whatever requests are, you know, put upon them. And I think that conservatives especially find that morally reprehensible. It should not still be surviving. It's, it's a traitor in a sense. The institution bends to the whims of whatever is in place. But in my opinion, it could serve to prolong democracy. It could also, on the other hand, usher us into authoritarianism. I think the conservative critiques that I'm thinking about are the kind of executive orders that are against critical race theory and, and these kinds of things. And to me, the critique is less that universities are shapeshifters, although I think there's truth to that statement. Um, than that the universities are initiators in the Buckleyan tradition of a new religion, that they're basically making moral claims that are antithetical to the founding moral claims of the country. And what's so fascinating to me about that is that it's so central, that whole kind of idea is so central to kind of like Protestantism itself, which emerges from the University of Wittenberg in the early 16th century on the part of a professor who uses the forms of disputation that he understood from the kind of, from the university protocols of his day, the university has historically given birth to new religions. And in as much as America is a Protestant country, which it isn't entirely, but in as much as I think many conservatives argue that it ought to be, not Buckley, who is Catholic, but many conservatives, and to the extent that kind of modern evangelical Christianity derives from that kind of Protestant root, actually they fear something in their own history. They fear the idea that the university could be the source of a new religion that borrows kind of forms from existing religions and that persuades a new generation to become schismatic or to break off. So that's what's interesting to me about kind of like contemporary conservatism is like, there's truth to the claim that the university is like a moral entity. And I think academics should own that. I don't think they should hypocritically put things on students, but I think, I think conservatives need to dig deep into their own kind of phantasmatic structure, really ask themselves how many Marxists are actually on, on campus. <laughs> More people are reading Marx in my meme comment section than in, in the You know, university. that's probably true. And everybody <laughs> should read Marx. I mean, like, just as everybody should read Machiavelli and Locke and so forth, I wager that Locke is more science than Marx at Amherst College. But um, back to your point about the university and the form in which it, it should survive, like, I do think it has a place and function. I think that place and function should help to be to establish the relationship between the disputable and the indisputable in whatever kind of weak way that that's possible under conditions of like intellectual property rights. I also think that universities, you know, coming back to Foucault, institutions are places where conflict can be mediated without conflict becoming immediate. And that's dispositive. Mm -hmm. That's not me. And I think institutions need, we need to do a better job of doing that, not simply politically, but also epistemologically, I think. Well, it's like case law. I mean, like you're, you're, you're pulling something out and isolating it as a case and studying it and examining it and arbitrating it. And that's, I think, the exact purpose of the university. One of the things you said to me before when we were prepping for this was that conservatives are not conservative enough and they should go back farther if they really want to be conservative. So I'd love to hear you elaborate. Sure. On that. I mean, I think that there are a bunch of us who are kind of looking at originalism. Lawrence Lessig, Justice Jackson, who lots of scholars and lots of justices who are basically saying like, well, contemporary conservatives are not really doing justice to what kind of originalist thought could and should have been. And it's a dangerous argument for any number of reasons. But if you simply take the university, it's manifestly the case that Madison was really interested in the idea of the university as an institution that could help establish checks and balances in the area of what he called faction, 
which is kind of like quasi civil war battle of interests between certainly different kinds of capitalists, but also people with very divergent religious views. So Madison was very invested in this idea of federal university that would be non-sectarian and so forth. And I think that there's an argument that essentially the founders really thought that there should be a place for an independent university in the United States. And that absent that, the kind of idea of a government founded on opinion wouldn't survive. So that's the kind of thing I have in mind. When it comes to Buckley, you know, Buckley's entire argument is that the consumers, i.e. the parents, should dictate the choices about the kind of product, uh, the commodity, which is the education, i.e. the university. So parents should be in charge of the curriculum. I submit that if you read Montesquieu, who was formative for the founders, Montesquieu kind of believed that the, the family, the masters, i.e. the kind of professors or the kind of formal education, and then the world all presented contrasting forms of education and that in the conflict between those forms of education, one would find the best education. And so there too, I just think like Buckley's writing a polemic, he's not claiming to write a balanced inquiry, but there are reasons within the kind of lexicon of the American right to kind of say, this makes no sense. This idea that a family should kind of dictate the conditions under which I'm taught physics, you know, or Chemistry with Christ only. We can only yeah, have chemistry or, or with even to talk more directly about history, um, because somebody who's dedicated their entire life to the study of history should have more credibility and even as you were saying earlier, authority than somebody who's interested in history has strong opinions on history, does it in their spare time, but hasn't dedicated every waking minute of their life to it, which is what historians, in my perspective, do. So, in my view, what's happening right now is that. I don't think many conservatives are originalists. I think that conservatives are becoming nationalists. They're becoming protectionists. They're abandoning a lot of the positions that people like Buckley believed in. And their entire range of arguments that I think people who care about the future of the university could deploy in states where people like maybe Georgia, I'm not sure, where people care um, still about originalism and where those arguments could seek to persuade state legislatures not to engage in just straight up censorship of scholarly activity. And originalism, I think, has a part to play in that. I can see that your point when you when you made it about conservatives not being uh, what they used to be. Everyone knows that there's this neoconservatism that's happening. And I think they're very confused about the institutions as they stand because they don't want to be anti-establishment, but they have to be anti-establishment if they don't like the establishments. And so I think there's kind of a contradiction within that. But I think there's an interesting thing that's happening. Like if you look at the University of Austin, Texas, it's kind of, it's factionalizing. And I think in this sense of factionalization, it's a good thing. We need conservative institutions. We need institutions that differ from the majority. Who was it that you quoted saying uh, the tyranny right. of the majority destroys my desire to think? More or less Tocqueville, yeah. So, I mean, whatever's happening with conservatives, we have to embrace it and we have to kind of deal with it as it stands, just like we have to deal with what's happening with the left. I see your argument about kind of like returning to originalism, but I think it's a fat chance at this point, you know, they're they're off on a tangent. So we have to kind of see where they're going and and watch that. When I saw you presenting on academic freedom and the university as a really, really important piece of our democracy, I couldn't agree more. And I think moving forward, that's my interest, is how do we use the academy to continue what we have going and, and make it better? Because it's not that bad. And I know Foucault was kind of anti-enlightenment, but things are not as bad as they could be. No, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think you and I might differ in our reading of Foucault. I think Foucault carried forward a legacy of a Kantian enlightenment, but we can set that to the side. I think you and I are in agreement that a kind of melancholic narrative is kind of running across purposes to the future of the university. And that's the way I'm translating what you're saying about doom and gloom, I think it would be easy to find an entire range of critiques of the university that are written in a minor key and that emphasize what Esposito, this Italian philosopher, would call not institution, but destitution, ruin, corruption, rot, 
essentially that the best days are behind us and so on and so forth. Beginning with Reddings um, and University in Ruins, there's been an entire kind of like 30 year run basically of like deeply melancholic arguments. The best days of the university are behind it and the rest is silence. So I don't think one wants to oppose optimism to that. I think one wants to say, well, what can be saved? What, what's recuperable? And when we look around us, what is the world asking us to do without being grandiose, you know, what should we respond to today? And what I'm really kind of like focused on in my own work is the experience of time that the university entails. I mean, think about the institutions in our political life. They're all pretty short term. I mean, by design, by design, with the exception of the judiciary, elective office every couple of years, the market can't think that far in advance. These devices, they seem like they're great, but they're disposable. They cut up our attention spans into milliseconds. And so what are the institutions in late modern life that are capable of thinking in broad swaths of time? And to me, when I think about triage and 50 year, you know, sweeps or in 200 year sweeps, like where are those ideas coming from? What you're talking about. It comes from that intergenerational exchange. So I think about my experience getting my PhD. I had a lot of ideas. I was young and vigorous and full of, um, you know, hubris and thinking I could do all these things. Whereas my professor was like, no, 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 we're going to do this. This is bread and butter. And I'm like, but can I please try this? Can I please do that? And we did some cool stuff as a result of those two, like holding on to what we have and my brash kind of excitement. Maybe we need a long tenure and a short tenure. And I read your argument about this, about how we need the, the length of tenure as kind of a, I don't want to say like a political institution, but like you said, it's kind of a mainstay political institution. But what if we had short-term tenure as well? I think there would have to be some deletion of administration, quite a bit of that. And I think a cut down of tenure as it stands, it's not indefinite tenure. I think there's more to be done with this. And if the institution's going to survive whatever black hole we're in right now, it's going to have to make changes as it always yeah. has. No argument there. And I think the word that really comes to my mind is cruelty. I think that there's a lot of cruelty in the way that these institutions conduct themselves. And in the worst case scenario, that cruelty is disavowed with reference to the grand ideals that I talked about in that lecture and that I sometimes talk about in, in other work. And so I'd like to see the institution take more responsibility for those moments of cruelty and to try and mitigate them. I think that the university is eating its seed corn and has been for a long time. And more than anything else, it's that kind of the, the question of the existential crisis of the university for me is who's going to take our place when this generation of academics retires? And we're not asking that question nearly enough. Well, I think the answer is an even worse professional managerial class, because I don't see the creativity and innovation in the people who are trudging along the academic pipeline in, in the youth. They are driven. They are box checkers. They do everything they have to do to get there. And I see the most creative and innovative people going off into more capitalistic ventures, to be honest. So that's who I think is going to take up the reins. I, I mean, I'll take your word for it. I, I don't know what you see and I'll, I'll just take that as data. You know, what you're saying causes me worry, certainly. I mean, well, it should, because if you think about what it takes when you got your job versus the youngest professor, you know, the one that was just hired, what do you see as the differences? I mean, here's what I'll say about what hasn't changed, which is to go back to your point about impotence. And this actually is right in Weber as well. This really, I think, important lecture on the vocation of science, where he talks about the element of chance in the scholarly life. I mean, this is 1917. And, you know, science requires absolute passion, absolute devotion, and then just accident. There's no reason why some people get jobs and other people don't. There's just none. And Weber says quite plainly and scandalously, you know, people who tell you otherwise are kind of in engaged in self-mythologization. And so that's terrifying. That's a really scary part of the profession. And I don't know how it could be altered, but I, I think the element of chance is kind of like central. What's gone down, I think, in my perspective is this kind of sense of 
kind of governance or citizenship, back to your point about administration, the students who are involved in unionization, the grad students who are involved in unionization drive tend to be better at shared governance once they enter into jobs because unionization has given them insights into the way universities work. They've set meetings with presidents or deans or provosts or what have you, and they have a sense of the conditions of their own professional life. If you don't have that kind of experience and you're just worried about getting tenure and as a kind of end all be all, I think tenure has become deeply counterproductive. I think tenure has stopped being a reason to be fearless and outspoken and kind of critical. And it's a reason to keep your head down, to say nothing, to criticize no one and so forth. So that's the main difference. I think a lot of people are kind of like alive to the fact that there's a lot of talent out there. They want to hold on to their jobs. And I'm speaking just in my own name here. I'm not speaking pledge or any, obviously this whole, yeah. you know, discussion is that way, but I see a kind of a unwillingness to regard the profession as a worthy part of the enterprise. I think the younger mm. generation is more suspicious of the university, probably as they should be. And their question is, what can the university do for me and how can I protect myself from it? And mm. the reason why that scares mm. me is that I think that unless faculty enter into administrative jobs and do the kind of shared governance or administration themselves, then we're going to be in an even, an even worse position. Because when mm -hmm. classrooms get administered by people who have never foot in classrooms, the whole thing spins off its axis and just kind of topples over. Um, so I really mm -hmm. look for young colleagues who are asking the kind of general questions, the existential questions of like, like, what is this all for? What's the point? I look for people who think carefully about university bureaucracies and where the lines are, how to protect the profession and so forth. And I look for kind of verb and spark too, and all of that stuff. But I look for intellectual humility with regard to the kind of knowledge claims that so many people come to the table with and not just mm -hmm. people in my department or in my college and so forth. And there are a lot of people out there like that. There are tons and tons of really, really good scholars. But the things that scare me most are the kind of hyper-professionalization, the utilitarianism you're talking about, the kind of hyper-goal driven. Yeah, I agree. I've been thinking a lot about this and I'm, I don't have the answer yet, but I think it's going to require, as I always say, a multi-pronged solution to kind of get where we want to go. And I think all of this is, is kind of soul searching. That's what I consider to be what I'm doing on this podcast is kind of like looking for the soul of knowledge at this point. Like, where is it going? Where was it? Does it exist? What are we doing with it? Where do we want it to be? Do we want to pretend there's a soul? If so, fine. But I think we don't know what we want these institutions to do anymore. And that's part of a big existential crisis. I think when you think about a personal existential crisis, we're all trying to figure out what we want. Like when you come to that moment, it's because you're dissatisfied with whatever is going on. And so I think that's our charge is to figure out what we want these institutions to do in the future. I, I think that's really well put. And I think I won't add anything to it. I think that's right. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll stop there. And of course, we did not stop there. As you may notice, I have tried to edit the episodes down to an hour or less, but that leaves a ton of discussion as bonus content. So after the next two episodes, I'll take a break from season one and decide what small tweaks need to be made to the show. And one of those tweaks may be releasing whole episodes as is. If you want to show support for bringing the full episode out from behind the paywall, head over to the newsletter and you'll find a 50% off coupon. Your support will allow me to free up some time and resources that are currently spent on editing and focus more on solutions to some of these problems we've identified. Thanks for your support. And as always, your feedback is welcome at theorygang.io forward slash newsletter.